I'm just going to hit the live now. All right. Well, welcome everybody to uh, our channel here tonight. And we've got uh, some special guests here for you. We've got uh, Dieter Kabuth down in the lower right there. And we've got Muck in the upper right, uh, Muck Simons. And then we've got Travis O'Shea in the bottom left and i'm your host tonight mike friesen and we are just super excited to uh bring some elk calling seminar here tonight live so there'll be some people joining in uh shortly i think um but please feel free to comment in the comment section below because we would love to hear from you and we are going to be doing a, a uh, giveaway uh, Travis O'Shea is the owner of Wapiti River Outdoors right here. So he's got bugle tubes and reeds, thermal, thermal checkers, etc. So we'll be doing a full giveaway tonight on that. And I will post it in the comments as well. So please let us know that you're here. That's how you'll be entered. So post in the comments um, that we know that you're here. And we'll make sure that you guys get entered into the draw. All right, so thanks guys for joining in. And uh, yeah, so what we're gonna do is we're going to first start out by just talking a little bit about the, um, the, the usage of the calls and stuff. So we're gonna let the, the pros take over here. Uh, I should mention too that uh, we've got some world champ out callers here with us tonight as well. So Dieter, he is a four-time world champ and Travis has won it twice. And uh, just the once, 2015. Oh, sorry. sorry, just the once there. And then Muck's been a, a top finisher as well. So we've got some really good experience, lots of hunting experience, not just calling experience here tonight. So yeah, welcome here, everybody. And Muck, why don't you take us over here and just uh, on the usage of elk reeds and and uh, for our beginners here tonight. Sure. Um, first of all, there's there's literally hundreds of uh, manufacturers for various calls, uh, one of which we have Travis here, and he, he's going to talk about his stuff. But primarily what we use in the field when it comes to making uh, elk talk is is the mouth reed or uh, a like what we call a manufactured call that doesn't fit in your mouth like that. And I think for the most part, we're going to be talking about the mouth reads tonight. And uh, I'm going to defer to Travis to talk about that because that's, that's his specialty, but there's very various types of, of mouth reads from the latex. And of course, like I said, I'll, I'll defer to Travis because he's the, the guy that makes these. And, and I think he probably articulated a little bit better about what we do when it comes to mouth reads. Yeah. Um, yeah, basically. And with all the reads, basically like there, we're going to talk about a little bit later on there's sing single latex reads and then there's double and triples. For all my calling, I pretty much keep it to a single read. Uh, they're basically easier for the beginner caller and right up through to the professional guys. You know, so kind of keep it keep it as simple as possible, even when you're out in the bush hunting, because simpler is better. Because <clears throat> you want to just make the proper sounds at the proper time, basically. So. So what are what are some of the different mouth positions for the mouth read there, uh, Travis? So let's let's talk about your mouth reads a little bit. You've got the dome shape. Yeah, yeah. So the the dome is really a. It was actually invented by um, I believe it was Rocky Jacobson, and so he had a patent on it for a number of years, and now the patent's up. So a lot of the companies, pretty much every company now has a dome on their read in their in their lineup down the line somewhere um what the dome does it actually holds when it's on where's the camera here when it's on your tongue it holds the reed kind of straight like that beginner callers you'll see the reed will kind of want to turn left or right in the roof of their mouth and when the reed's sideways you're not getting any sound so how a reed actually works the, the reed goes straight edge out 
like that. And then basically it goes in the roof of your mouth and you're pressing up with your tongue on the bottom like this here. So you're basically pressing with the back part of your tongue. And that's how your tones are changing. So all the air is actually going across this latex, kind of just across there when latex vibrates, that's what makes the sound. So okay. um, basically, you know, when you're, we probably all did it when we were kids, you grab a piece of grass from the, from the ground there and you put it between your thumbs and you're squawking on it to your parents and it's actually vibrating and making noise, noise, exactly what you're doing with the L Creed. So, okay. Um, Dieter or Muck, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I will remember <clears throat> when Rocky um, invented that, it was called the palate plate and then um, Primo's, I'm not going to get into the whole history of it, but anyways, Primo's bought the rights to sell it. And then um, Rocky was able to, at the, when the patent ran up for himself, was able to make those calls for himself. And um, just like Travis said, just like a lot of other manufacturers jumped on board. Um, yeah, I, I, li I prefer one without the dome on it for me personally. Um, it just because I, I use a little bit more pressure than probably the average person, I guess. And so when you're pressing on this with your tongue, say this is your tongue, my finger right here. When you're pressing on that with your tongue, I press a little bit harder than some people. So when I usually cuts out on me, when I hit that dome or that pallet plate, um, if I have that pallet plate, the one with the little piece of metal that sticks up, I actually take like a Leatherman tool and bend it up a little bit. So I don't, I don't cut it off. Um, but this is why you want to try different diaphragms just to try because you don't know what's preferable. I think, I think Travis makes them both ways. I know a lot of different manufacturers make them both ways with the dome or yep. without the dome. I just prefer it without. And, but just like Travis said, it positions up into your roof of your mouth and your, your tongue goes up against it. And when you press soft on it, it's a low pitch. As I steadily increase the pressure, it goes from a low pitch up to a high pitch. That's your bugle. When you press high and come down soft, that's your cow call. That's and then Travis and I will and everybody Muck will go through all of this as we progress. But the, I prefer them without the dome. That's not to say there's a lot more of them sold with the dome than without the dome. But personally, I like it without the dome. Personal preference, that, and that's all. I will say that the feedback has been when it comes to the dome, I would say with the people that I'm helping teach, the feedback has been that the dome has been easier for new, new callers than without. Uh, and so I, I would say that uh, if you're just starting out, you might want to consider the dome. And if, if it's something that uh, once you get a little bit more advanced, you go without. Uh, yeah, I I'm, I'm with you, Dieter. I, I could use either or, but uh, I do push people to use the domes when they're first trying out. I agree. They were, they are easier to use. No question. Just so everybody knows that. Yeah. And For one sure. other, one other thing I would put in there as well is yes, I run Wapiti River outdoors, but try Bugling Bowl, try Phelps, try whoever your companies that you can buy local reeds from find that one reed that works the best for you for bugling, cow calling, Try to find a read that does everything for you. And it doesn't matter if it's my company or someone else's company. Once you find that read, just buy eight or 10 of them and you're set up basically for, for the whole season, basically. And uh, you'll know from future times, you know, you'll still want to try others down the road. But when that you find that perfect fit for you, just let it rip on that one. I've been using the same calls up until I met Travis uh, Larry D. Jones calls since 1990 and give you an idea. Once you find something that works for you, uh, you, you generally stick with it. So I still have some kicking around in my pouch, but uh, uh, yeah, as soon as you find something you like, doesn't matter what manufacturers you you'll, you'll instantly uh, it's like the type of vehicle you drive. Some people prefer uh, a Dodge over a Ford, but it doesn't matter. You just have to find it. So I agree with you. Awesome. All right. Well, I just wanted to welcome some more viewers here. Uh, thanks for signing in. If you missed it before, uh, please comment in the live comments below uh, because that's going to get entered to, for you guys to win a bugle package uh, from Wapiti River Outdoors here with Travis O'Shea. And we were just talking about uh, read usage and call usage here. So what I'd like to do 
is uh, we're going to transition a little bit. And if you guys have comments, uh, please ask questions in the live feed as we start going through some of the content here. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn it over to uh, Muck and Dieter right now. And we are going to start going into cow calling. So if you guys have uh, your calls or your reads handy, do have them because we're going to be going through uh, different types of calls and things like that. But uh, guys, I'll turn that over to you now. Well, just do you mind if I take a minute and just kind of explain something that we maybe didn't? Sure. Throw? So when you put this in your mouth, it goes up into the roof of your palate of your of your mouth. And that's super important that when you, you find a read that'll fit you and you can buy uh, reads that are smaller, um, the, the gap in here is smaller, but it goes into the roof of your mouth. And it's important that you, you do that because for most people that are just starting out, you'll get a gag reflex when you put that in your mouth and you really have to overcome that. I would say out of all the people that I've taught, I would say over half of them have that gag reflex and they instantly snap back with, I can't use that thing because it, it get, makes me want to gag. And I just want to say that the way that you get over that is simply by putting it in your mouth as, as often as you can and by, by having it in your mouth, eventually you'll overcome that gag reflex. And then that's when you can start making tones. Because if you take this, if you're a new caller and you put this in your mouth and then you try to concentrate on making sounds, it's not going to go very well. And you're going to have a bad experience. So what I always say, and I think Travis brought this up at a, one other time, is that if you put it in your mouth, don't even worry about making sounds with it. Just get used to it, have it in your mouth. So you, you, if it, And these will fit very com comfortably in an adult's mouth or even like even kids can wear them. So they go up in the, the roof of your mouth. And then what I tell people is I try, I say, try to talk with it because by talking with it, you'll get used to that, uh, getting rid of that gag reflex. And by talking with it, by pushing air over that reed, even though you're not really using your tongue on it, you're going to learn to start. It's going to start to vibrate. And once it starts to vibrate, you're going to make some tones. So yeah, just when you put that in your mouth, you have to get rid of that gag reflex. And where I tell everybody to do it is when you're driving in the car, best time to do it because you don't, you're not, you're not interfering with anybody else by making noise. And if you have to spit it out, you can put it back right back in. So just put it in your mouth. You're going to drive in your car and then just talk with it. And eventually <laughs> you'll, you'll hear how I'm pressing air over it. And then eventually you get into making <laughs> you're making sounds with it. So that's, I just wanted to talk about that. If you yeah, want to start sure. out with call, calls, Mark, go ahead. Okay. So, so the way I do um, my cow calls when I'm teaching people is uh, first of all, I enjoy uh, cow talk. Uh, cows are very social animals. They, they actually, they talk all year round where the bulls primarily will, will, will bugle or, or have a bull call talk when they're rutting or when they're getting to rut and a little bit after, but the cows are always, always talking and, and they're generally in a lot more uh, social groups than the bulls. So if you've ever been fortunate enough to get in amongst the cows and you'll hear them, they make so many different sounds, but if you're just starting out, uh, I'm just going to bring up a couple of things. And Dieter's really good about the, the these these type of calls. There's so many cow calls on the market that you can use to make different sounds. Uh, that you, if you're having trouble with the mouth read, you can go to a soft bite, which you simply just bite down on it, and and then you put air in it, and and it'll make that sound. So for the read, so the way I explain how to 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 make sounds with the read is is think of a, a graph, a, a, a you know an L graft and on the left side is uh, pressure and on the bottom is time. So as you're putting pressure over time uh, is how you're going to make the cow call. So the bull call and will, and Travis will get into that in my opinion is, is lower amount of or steady pressure over a long period of time. So you start off with a low pressure and a, and a growl. And as you go up higher, you'll, you'll eventually get to a point where you come off. The cow, in my opinion, is is the opposite. It's it's a large amount of pressure over a short amount of time, and then you softly come off. So the way I'm going to demonstrate that, so so imagine pressure over time. So I'm going to put lots of air over it, and then I'm going to slowly let it come off. And whereas the bull is going to be different, so it'll sound like this. So 
You see, I was using my lips there differently. That's how I could change different talk. If I'm a calf or a cow or something like that, but just by changing my mouth, I can also change the tone of it. So as you put this in your mouth, I'm going to bring air up from my chest and I'm going to blow it over that reed, but I'm going to put lots of pressure on it to bring that octave nice and high. And then I'm going to slowly or softly bring it off. If that makes any sense. So where a bull would be like, and you slowly put pressure on there. I'm going to have pressure on this reed when I first start. So my tongue is pressing on that reed as I'm delivering that air over the reed. So, so I'm pressing so like those other fellas, so I'm pressing with my tongue on that reed fairly hard before I even start. And as I press that, uh, as I deliver the air over that reed, I'm slowly releasing it off. And that's how you'll do a cow talk. Dieter, do you want to jump in there with anything? Yeah, um, I'm just going to demonstrate um, what you said, Muck, about your lips. Um, so when you cow call, like, like Muck said, I'm not going to reiterate too much, but just press hard with your tongue to make a high note and then come down slow. So I'm gonna press hard with the latex. Can you see that? Press hard, Eww. that's how it's gonna work. Okay, but I'm gonna take it a step further. If you wanna sound like a calf, smile when you do it. It's gonna sound more higher pitch, more like a younger, like a younger elk. Bring your lips to an O, it'll make a different tone. Everybody can hear that. Why is that important? The reason it's important is because elk are herd animals. Like Muck said, they make sounds all year round 365 days a year. They're the most vocal out of all of the deer species. Now, when you're doing that, there's calves within a herd structure and there's mature cows within a herd structure. So the more elk you can portray and sound like, especially during the rut for elk or even at post rut or pre, the more elk you can make it sound like a, like a natural herd of animals, the more you increase your chances of calling elk to you, especially bulls during the rut. And, um, you know, that's coming up here in a couple of weeks. But just that little tip right there. And then I'm going to get into some external calls, but I'll wait for you guys to tell me when we're done with the diaphragms, and I'll jump into that part. So just that's to, all I have to add to your, what you said, Muck. Yeah, so just to go back there, uh, Dieter, you did a great job. So, guys, when you're putting your tongue on that, you, it's important if you're trying to do the cow. And and I would say the cow actually uh, – is, is pretty easy to make sounds right out of the gate for somebody that's new because all you really have to do is put a lot of pressure on your reed and and then blow air past. I think that is, as long as you have that seated in your mouth properly and you put quite a bit of pressure on there, all you have to do is, is blow and then just slowly release. And the best way to, to, to even understand it for a reed is to get a call like this. Uh, and Dieter's going to talk more about some more uh, calls, but the same principle for using a soft bite though. So let's say you can't use this for whatever reason, you use the same principle as on a soft bite where you're gonna press down on it, you're gonna blow hard on it, and then you're gonna low let off on it. So, so I put a lot of, I pressed down, I pressed a lot of air in there or pushed a lot in there and then I let off on it. So if you can't use that, use a reed but it's the same principle with the with the with the cow you have to start at a high octave and then come down softly so i want to i want to before i go into a little bit more how to use the external type cow calls i just want to mention this it's really important what you're hearing out there when you hear about those long drawn out cow calls that muck and i had just done that's everything's fine within the herd structure everything's relaxed Long drawn out calls, everything's fine within the herd structure. But when you hear it like this, more short and choppy, elk are nervous. I call it anxiety call, or some people call it a chirp. Um, Muck, why don't you grab that squeeze cow call really quick? That's the only way you can make the sound with that. This one? Yep. 
Hear that? When elk do that, they're nervous. So I found over the years when I'm moving in on a herd of elk, if I if I tend to get if I spook one or they just feel nervous, they feel a presence around them or whatever, they'll they'll start to make this type of a sound. It's not drawn out where everything's relaxed. When you're hunting in the woods and you hear elk do that, you make, they're making that nervous type chirp sound. You want to match the same anxiety level that they are. So if they're nervous, you're going to tell that elk, well, guess what? I'm nervous here too. It sounds a lot more natural. Hear the different pitches, different elk. They're nervous. But after, after about a minute or so, what we're going to start to do is this, and it tends to relax that herd. When you start doing that, it really tends to relax that herd. So you don't just rush right in there, but it, it keeps them from running off. That's the most important thing. So um, I've, I've done this time and time again. I've called in over 120 bulls to a kill, a lot more than that over the years, but I'm talking about just bulls to a kill over the years. Um, but draw out those cow calls. It tends to relax them. I want to get into the, into the so diet. Dieter, into the, yes. Sorry. I'm just going to interrupt you there for a second. Um, would there be any particular instance that you would use an anxiety call if you weren't hearing that? Like, is there any other reason to use an anxiety call other than to match the herd behavior? No, I okay. never do it. No, I just don't walk around the woods. Going, ew, ew. Um, I just, I guess let's, let's digress. Let's go back. I love that, that squeeze call. It sounds like a calf in distress or calf looking like a lost calf, not a calf in distress, but a lost calf. When Muck, go ahead and hit that again. And I'm going to hit the long drawn out one. What that's telling in herd talk, you're you're lost over there. You don't know where we are. Here we are. Everything's fine over here. So okay. as I'm walking through the woods, especially during rifle season when the bugling stops a lot of times, um, I like stalking through the woods, trying to get close. And by making that lost calf type sound, you know, squeeze call, and the long drawn out one with an external or a diaphragm type call, I tend to get a lot closer to the elk where I might be able to get a shot with a rifle or a muzzle loader. So, so one one thing, Mike, that uh, gets brought up all the time is why we use the uh, the mouth read over, say, one of the external ones. Mm -hmm. And I would say the the biggest advantage to this is it frees up your hands, so you could use you could use your binoculars or whatever, and. Uh, you can make so many different, like Dieter was just doing there. He made like four different cow or uh, calf and cow combinations with the reed that you can't really make with the, with the sort of the external calls. So the reason we use these, well, one, I find that I think that they sound more realistic, but it frees up your hands to doing whatever else you have to do. That's the, that's the primary. Like if you have to stop, a bull like if a bull's moving and you need them to stop the the mouth read is the easiest way in the world to do that so yeah I mean, check this out really quick you could you could be at full draw <coughs> and you have your hands freed up just like muck that's the best way to illustrate that so with reeds versus mouth uh like those other mouth calls then is there is it a more realistic sound to also use a reed um I've called in a lot of bulls to the freezer and um, I've killed more bulls probably with these open reed style calls. This is a Carlton one by Wayne Carlton. This is Rocky mountain uh, elk calls right here, which is a good one. Here's another one by Carlton. Here's another one by Rocky mountain elk calls. I know Jason Phelps also makes one. There's other companies. Primo's makes these are the ones I just prefer. I've got them around my neck. The reason I like these calls, and that's going to sound like a duck. It's not going to, in the woods, it sounds fantastic. But in here in this little, little room and over a little microphone, um, 
right here on my device, it's not going to sound the same, but I want to assure you these calls right here are, are very effective. And the reason it's effective is because it's a lower tone. It -hmm. sounds like a more mature elk. Elk live in a hierarchy system. There's calves within a herd structure. There's lead cows within a herd structure. Now these cows aren't walking around with a, 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 a flag going here, follow me. I'm a lead cow. But the way the elk have evolved over hundreds, thousands of years is those lead cows know how to get from the summer feeding grounds up, up to the winter grounds, down to the winter grounds so they can find feed. Those calves don't know how to do it. And vice versa, they know how to get from their winter grounds back up into the summer range um, where, where you find them a lot of times. And they follow those lead cows. I'm going to share a little quick story. So I was at the Valles Caldera Preserve down in New Mexico one year. And there was literally probably 500 head of elk. It's, it's a caldera. The caldera is a big volcano. And it's just, this, this caldera is probably about 25 miles across or, or maybe less. Probably not 25 miles, but it's a big, big flat meadow area. And all these elk came out. And I, and I was sitting in this cabin one morning and I'm listening to all these cows throughout this whole meadow. As far as you can see, there's elk. And they're making these cow calls. And I'm wondering, okay, how are they going to know which group to go with when they go to bed? You know, they each have their own little herd structure. And I noticed that when the cows made a, the mature cows made a, that, you know, that lower deep tone that you can't get with a diaphragm. I noticed like like this small group of elk would just kind of follow those elk. And then the other group would may have a little mature cow call. They would follow. It just confirmed what I what I always say to people that these these are mature cow sound. You can you can almost produce it with a diaphragm, but the external calls are the, to me the most effective as far as to me calling an elk. And how to use it is this way. So there's an open read. Hold it up to the. So there's mm-hmm. an open read. Don't get intimidated by this. An open read. Maybe this one illustrates it a little bit more. Maybe. Yeah, that's all clear. But um, but there's an open read here. And what you do is what I like to do is just rest my teeth. I mean, just feather soft as much as it right there. And I'll make that high note. Also, when you get these calls, the rubber bands, like in this position right here, on just about all of them, I like to roll it up about one more roll so it's right there. So you're going to make that, you're going to just hold that down with your your um, with your with lip, your teeth. I just kind of hold it down with my teeth. Just get the high note. If you go too far at the end, you're going to cut out. But go about right here, you're going to get that, that sweet spot, that ee. And then what I do is I run my lips to the rubber band, let off the pressure with your teeth right away, just your lips in slow motion, and you're going to run your lips to that rubber band and run out of breath with it. So it's going to be like this. Hopefully it'll show you this. Hopefully that illustrated that. Yep. If you wanted to make those short chirp sounds, just... <laughs> run your lip to the rubber band if you want to draw it out. Also, one more last thing. These were real. These were really developed by a guy in Colorado. You don't need to know all this, but his name was Major Boddicker. These open reeded cow calls. Wayne Carlton discovered them as a cow call back in about 1987-88. But this was invented by a guy by the name of Major Boddicker with, with a game call company called Critter Call, and they were really a predator call. They were a coyote call, and they're fantastic coyote, coyote calls. I've called in. For, for TV shows that I've called in a lot of coyotes with this, and it's just like. <laughs> like a trombone going in and out real quick, like a trombone. Um, it'll give you that quiver type sound that it makes it sound like a dying rabbit. <laughs> and I'm just adjusting the pressure with, with my lip and my teeth just a little bit on there, very softly and very slight. Just to give you a little bit of a extra ammunition when you get one of these external calls that's really what they were designed to do but they make a fantastic cow call so so mike before you move on uh just to just to add what dieter has so when and i see dieter has his on whenever i'm hunting or guiding i always have uh just like dieter around my neck i call it my jewelry and uh 
it, really all it is is a duck uh, a duck or a goose lanyard with all these different calls on it. And the reason we have that, guys, is because if this doesn't work and the sounds that you can't make with this, then you have so many options to go to. And at the end of the day, you want to you want it you want to make them feel comfortable, like Dieter had said. And so by making all those sounds you can really calm a herd down or a bull for that matter. You can calm them down to the point where you can usually get an opportunity to harvest them. So you, anybody that really knows anything about elk hunting will always have this stuff hanging around their neck. And it's, it really is because if one thing doesn't work, the other one might, or it might be the totality of it all. And so it's important that if you, if you can master this for a cow call, that you still have those other options to go to. I mean, I think this call right here, I mean, it's been around since the dawn of time and it's exactly what uh, Dieter was saying. It's a, it, it's used exactly. You can see the read on it and same thing. You know, it's, it's the same thing. And then there's a, there's a small one that goes with it that I don't have it on there right now. But the point being is if, for cows in particular, if you want to call a, a calm a bull down, just use all kinds of, of cow talk. Awesome. Hey, Mark, really quick, yeah. if I could just interject. So mm -hmm. one more external cow call I want to talk about, and I don't have one with me, but Muck has one, is a bite and blow. You pinched, I showed it to you earlier, but you pinch down hard with your teeth and you blow into it. And then as you, it makes your high pitch, and then you let up slow on it. Anytime I ever hear that call, to me, any bite and blow call on the market is a calf sound. And again, why is that important? Because now we're making herd sounds. But it's not my go-to call, but it, but it is effective in making elk sounds. So now I've got my diaphragm, I've got some external calls, and now I've got the bite and blow type call and a squeeze call. I'm making it sound like a whole herd of elk just with those few little calls like that. So, and just by moving your lips, you can make it sound like you're a couple more. You sound like a herd of elk. To a bull that's in the rut looking for some girlfriends, it's pretty enticing. Well, and what's that you always say, Muck? Uh, elk, elk are lovers, not fighters, right? Yeah, I, you know, I, I've been saying that ever since I started uh, guiding was my experiences. And, and I mean, everybody has their different opinions on this, but I just find that the majority of the bulls want to breed at that time of the year, of course they fight, they fight all the time and they're defending their, their herds and stuff like that. But when I'm, when we're hunting them, I just find that it's easier to seduce them with a cow call than it is with a, with a bull call. And so I always say they want to be lovers, not fighters. Yep. Good yep. analogy. So before we move on to uh, we're, before we turn it over to Travis here, Muck, can I just get you to go through the different cow sounds uh, one at a time, just to kind of wrap it up, like give us a relaxed sound, a chirp, you know, uh, Dieter, you could reference to the calf call there that you were doing with the reed, just to kind of give our viewers just a, a wrap up before we move on to the, to the bugle. You know what, Mike? I'm actually going to get Dieter to do this because I've sure. I've I've seen Dieter's presentations and he explains it better than anybody when it comes to the different talk and the and the mouth, the way you hold your mouth and stuff like that. Like I I think he would do way better justice. So Dieter, do you mind talking about that? Sure. Just do like oh, a all, but... just do like a two minute wrap up just to demonstrate the different types of calls and what they are. If it's a relaxed call or if it's a chirp or a distress or what have you. Okay. So once again, you put it in the roof of your mouth, the long drawn out calls, just to, to recap, is your relaxed call. Yeah. If you're using an external type call like this Rocky Mountain game call right here. Same thing, long drawn out. If you want it, if you hear that only when you hear them do this, if you hear them do the short choppy type, just start. I'm not drawing it out as long. I'm just dropping my, my pressure off a little faster. <coughs> just dropping off the pressure a little faster. That's more of your anxiety type call. Um, and then the other, other type of call would be a bark that we didn't touch on. That's a, that's a high pitch and you just drop it off right away. That's their warning call. I, I never use that call unless they do it. If they're nervous, if they bark, I bark. 
you're you're nervous over there. That's that's like a white tail snort if you've never heard it before. Right. That's their warning call. That's their white tail snort. Um, so if they do it, I do it. But then after a little while, again, I do those long drawn out relaxed calls, and it tends to relax them sometimes when you when they do that. Okay. Perfect. And yeah. Just uh, one tip there, just to kind of elaborate on the different tones there. If you're fortunate enough to, if you're after a big bull or a herd bull and you get close enough to the herd, always, always pay more attention to what the cow's doing than the bull, because she is going to alert the rest of the herd before he'll ever, because he's kind of following. You understand that the way a bull works when he's mm -hmm. in the rut, he's, he's trying to service the, 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 the cows, but he's a follower. He's not really leading, like he will herd them up. And, but at, but if you get fortunate enough to put eyes on the elk, watch the cows, because they're the ones that are going to do that call that, uh, that Dieter just did there and stuff like that, that are going to, and it kind of ruined your opportunity. The biggest awesome. bull that I've personally ever killed, I cow called in the lead cow to me. And there was about five cows and right behind, just like Muck said, was the bull. And I, I shot him. I shot him for a TV show on Hunter Specialties that year. Hey, Muck, before we go off the cow calls, would you pull out that bite and blow cow call really quick one more time and illustrate that? And again, folks, to me, this is the calf sound. Um, the open reeded sounds are more the cow call. But again, these bite and blow calls are just as important because now you're making herd sounds. Calves with an herd structure, mature cows with an herd structure. Now so, you're making natural sounds. So just like what Dieter was doing with that other one, he's he he's pressed down with his teeth. These ones are a little bit uh, user friendly than, than those in the, whereas you can actually squeeze it with your uh, upper and lower jaw. So I'm going to squeeze it and then I'm going to de deliver the air over the reed that's inside. The reed on these ones are on the inside and mm -hmm. it can be problematic because with these, it's a sealed unit that you can get saliva and stuff in there. So quite often you have to turn it upside down. But, but anyways, you're going to bite down on it. You're going to deliver the air and then you can make that long drawn out sound as, as what Dieter described. And I could also do a quick and short. Can you turn sideways there, Mark? So I'm pressing it. And as I'm delivering the air, I'm just slowly opening it up. And I'm allowing that, that reed to, or the, the, the clap on the reeds to, to less, less pressure. So these ones are really, if you can get, like, I think Travis, you have one of these, don't you? That you yeah. Sell? yeah. So if, if, if you can find yourself one of these as well as other ones, these are really, really easy friendly or user friendly. Just like if you have the Hoochie Mama, it, they're, they're super easy to use, but you just simply. You can make all kinds of tones with it. Awesome. So let me just reiterate. So when he's pitching, when he's pitching hard with his teeth, that's the high pitch. Okay. I can't do it with my voice, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's how it, that's how it, that's how he's working that call. Okay, great. Yeah. So just before we move on to the bugle, uh, for anybody that's jumped on since the last time we mentioned this, please drop your comments in the live feed comments. If you have questions, we are going to be doing a uh, short Q and A after we're done the, the bugle section. So if you have questions maybe regarding elk calling or even maybe a short question regarding elk strategy uh, for setting up, callers uh if you're trying to call one in like bow range uh we can answer that for you there and uh yeah also uh travis o'shea here uh owner of wapiti river outdoors he's got bugles and reeds check out his website as well and we'll also be doing a giveaway so make sure you comment that'll get you entered into the draw and uh, we'll post some information about that later on so with that travis i will turn it over to you and we will talk about the bugling now okay cool hey great job on the cow stuff there guys that's perfect so i'm gonna kind of lead off from the cow stuff because when i do a lot of seminars everybody comes up to me there's a lot of guys they come up first thing they say is i'm pretty good at cow calling but i can't bugle so i'll show them a little thing i was actually taught this by joel turner he shows this quite a bit it's just a scale similar to what Muck was talking about there before. So basically, <clears throat> I'm going to put the reed in, send air across it, and I'm just going to go up in the scale and then come back down. And I'll show you, once you learn this scale, you have a built-in cow call and a built-in bugle, 
right off the get-go. So and it's just low to a high pitch. So obviously that's not going to call you in an elk, but when you start shortening it up, that's how you get your cow sound. So that's how you get the cow sound off that little tone there that we showed you, the scale. Now, how do you get your bugle? Take that tone all the way up and instead of coming down with it, just end with your voice and go Rah! at the end. And I'm literally just going Rah! So take it up. <coughs> and when you do that Rah! sound across the latex, it gives you that little grunt growly type sound there. I think, so I think that's a really good teaching point there, Travis, yeah. just to, to practice those octaves. Um, yeah. Because I know even for myself, when you start getting really high and that latex starts fluttering a bit, uh, to start getting pitchy or you just all of a sudden you cut out and then you cut back in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, that's a great point there. Uh, once guys hit that certain high pitch tone there, for me, I actually take it up to the high pitch tone and then I back it down just a hair. And that's the tone I kind of stay in for, for my normal bugling. You guys are going to find with all your bugling, you're basically going to get into, I call it a rut, basically. And you get, it's like a rut, like your, like your tire trap goes in, that kind of rut. You're going to go to your favorite bugle sound. It's going to be your bugle. And your chuckles are going to be the same. You're going to have the same sequence. You're going to have the same sounding bugle. So my bugle is just simply this one here. That one I do over and over and over again. That's my one of my go-to favorite bugles. And basically every one of us is a little bit different. So how we introduce our voice and stuff to the reed, that's going to change all your bugles. So that's kind of one nice thing about the reeds. Every one of us, you know, there's there's millions of people out there. Every time they blow on an elk reed, it, every one of us sounds a little different so that's the that's kind of the one nice thing about an elk reed and basically how you're getting that voice in with with the with the sound you're just using your throat and you're just going throughout the start just start growling and the reed will take care of the rest after that so yeah just practice that basically you're going this is the tip of your tongue here you're basically just raising the back part of your tongue up like you're flexing your bicep and as you're flexing up that's how you're getting the sound so to get the, the actual sound i'm actually using the back part of my tongue the tip of my tongue is staying down and i'm actually touching my upper molars so when you put the reed in your mouth you kind of look funny but that's how it actually works. Yeah, and you got her. And basically, as you just start, like Muck said earlier, use the air in your diaphragm. That's a warm air versus when you whistle, that's a cold air. You're actually like huffing almost, hissing like a snake. So if you just start, and you do that with the reed. Now take your tongue up, tongue, tongue up. basically the basics to all your all your bugles so travis um you know just for for my own knowledge and i'm sure other people will wonder this as well is there is it just practice to avoid that pitchiness or, or is there like or are you positioning your tongue wrong um every one of us has a little different shape palette some are narrower some are longer like we're all just born a little bit different for me, I put the reed back as far as I can so that the air coming across the latex, the air hits that reed as fast as it can. But there's a fine line there. 
the further back in your mouth you put this thing, the faster your gag tendency is going to happen. So for me, I have it as far back as I can go without gagging on it. So just move it just a little bit further. And some guys actually have it quite far forward where it's kind of up by the front of their teeth. And then they're just working their tongue a little bit more. One thing I will tell you, if you use the tip of your tongue, let me say, if my tongue is dropped down like this, and if you introduce the tip of your tongue to the leading edge right here of the latex, you're gonna stop all that vibration that's happening with the, the fluttering of the latex. The minute you stop that, in there. Um, the minute you stop that vibration is when all the sound's gonna cut out. So that's why you really wanna use the back portion of your tongue and not the front. You don't wanna actually lift the front of your tongue out. That'll stop everything. Okay, so back of the tongue is more effective. Yeah, back, yeah, for, for most people, yeah. Back of the tongue and then middle portion, I would say. And then I'll, I'll show you on camera, like when I put the reed in, it's pretty far back. I don't okay, a little bit there. So it literally goes right up in the roof of your mouth. There is one misconception out there. Everybody thinks the tape seals to the roof of your mouth, but in fact, you can actually bugle on a reed with no tape on it. They're, everybody says, well, the air is going over top. So it's, they always say, well, I need to get a good seal. Um, but in truth, the actual air is going across the bottom of the reed. So this is up in the roof of your mouth. The air is going across the bottom of it. And that's making the sound. So, um, so yeah, once you learn that little scale going up and down, and I practice that lots. It's, uh, I don't honestly practice bugling and cow calling a whole lot. I work a lot on that scale up and down, up and down, and it gets really boring. But what it's actually teaching you is all your control over this read. And once you gain control over that read, your confidence level is just going to skyrocket. You'll take just normal bugling. anything you want with it and honestly it all comes from that scale up and down so when i do seminars i teach people just worry about that scale and do it till you're blue in the face and you're bored of it and that'll that'll really help a lot of people so Mike, can i jump in there just real quick absolutely yeah so just to add to that a couple of things that people don't understand when it comes to using these reads when you use this read and you're trying to do the low end with that you hear that how uh, travis is doing that growl you don't even need your tongue so if you're just learning how to do this you can just put it in your mouth and all you have to do is use your voice and just go er just like just simply that just go er and if you put that in your mouth just doing that with your voice will vibrate that read and that's the beginning to how almost all of us do our our calls so er, 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 and i'm not putting any tongue pressure on there just simply using the read in itself to vibrate it and then the other thing that you should be known when you're first learning to call most people just grab one read because they're 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 not cheap. They're about 10 bucks, but they just grab one because they, they don't know how to do it. And they destroy the latex really early in the process. And then they don't get the proper tones and it's super frustrating. So what I always tell people, if you're going to learn to call, please get a couple of reads because that first few times you do it, you're, you might wreck that. If as soon as you put a ripple in this latex, you're not going to get the same tones that you want to to, to be uh, effective. So make sure you get a couple of reads because most people I know are, are using well stretched out reads that they're, they're simply not getting the tones for that reason. Yeah, that's great, Mark. Because once you actually wear that latex out, as soon as you go up into the high note, you'll know that they, that reed's getting worn out. You won't be able to hit the high note. As soon as you're, if you can't hit that high note, it's a great cow call still, so don't throw it away. Put it in your pouch or whatever, wherever you keep your, your reeds. But keep it as a cow call. Go on to a brand new fresh reed. That latex is going to be nice and tight and straight across. That's how you want it. 
And in fact, check them at the store. If you go to the store and this latex is already wavy and and like looks like you know it's wavy. Work record. It's, it's loose. Yeah, it looks like kind of a work record vinyl. Yes, exactly. That's right. If you see a read like that and it's in the store, just go through to the next one behind it or behind mm -hmm. it or behind it and find the tight one that's there and take that one home with you. Um, you're going to, you're going to be, you're going to help yourself for your bugling and, and even your cow calling. It's going to be so much better for you. So Travis, before you move on to uh, maybe some chuckles or some different types of bull calling, yep. uh, I've got two of your calls here. So this one, I believe is the phantom. Yeah, that's the phantom. Okay. And then if I hold this one right up, you can see how much wider the latex is. I believe this is the mayhem. Yeah. Um, versus the the, phantom. the, full. the full draw. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. And so what would be, what would be the purpose between having a, a narrower and wider latex? Yeah. So believe it or not, like, uh, when I do a lot of seminars and stuff and trade shows at the, at all the shows, I'll hand out a lot of these reads to the kids and stuff. And a lot of them will just throw this regular size read in and they'll walk around the trade show for five, 10 minutes. And then they'll come running back to your booth and they'll be just squeaking and honk, you know, honking on this thing. Like they got it already. But for the few little ones out there, um, I'll give them, if they can't get the sounds on it, I'll give them a, what's the, the, the phantom. I see that. And it's that smaller frame. Yeah, exactly. So it's got a smaller frame to it. And there are a lot of guys out there that have a smaller palette as well. It's, it's the width of your palette up top. So what I always show people, take the tape and fold it over. And this is basically the frame. You'll feel the frame. That's hard aluminum in there. If that's touching on the inside of your upper molars, basically, then that reads too wide for you go down one size smaller and as long as it fits up in there, then you're good to go. So, um, but yeah, it's, it can be young kids that have a small palate. It can be ladies. It can be right up to full grown, you know, 250 pound guys. It's surprising, but we all have a little different shape. So it's, uh, there's no right, right. or wrong. Way. One thing I will say, the wider the reed and the latex you can go with, like the wider that this is, mm -hmm. the more realistic and easier the sounds are. So if you can get away with a wider latex, you have more air going across the reed. So you're going to sound a lot, uh, like Dieter said, it's a lower tone type sound. So mm -hmm. the bigger the latex and the thicker the latex, the lower the tone is going to be. Awesome. So, Okay, well, let's, um, if you want to go into some different types of bugles, like, um, like I know I'm pretty, like, I'm not the elk expert yeah. here, but like locates versus chuckles, when you would use different types of bugling sounds, uh, we sure. can move on to that as well here. Yeah, okay. So one thing I will say, there's a lot of other sounds besides just bugling and hitting a high note and growling and stuff. But we'll start in with just basic, basically going into a high note location bugle. And basically all you're doing, you're taking that reed and you're taking it up to the high note by raising your tongue. And you're just, the location bugles a little bit different from all the other bugles. You're holding this one for four or five, six seconds. You're just trying to get that high note out on the wind currents and over the next ridge and over the next ridge past that. So I'll do it without the bugle tube because the bugle tube kind of blows our microphones out a little bit. So, uh, Basically a low shape location bugle. Just get up, get that high note and hold it for an exaggerated period of time, like four or five, six seconds. In all, honestly, a real elk bugle is two to three seconds. So, and you'll know when you're moving in on a bull, when he's getting more worked up, He's not location bugling to you. He's getting aggressive and he's, his bugles are short. That's how you kind of know different. They're, it's like advertising bugling. They're, they're calling with a purpose kind of thing. So that's your, that's your basic uh, location bugle. Just take it up, hit a high note. And 
you can see I'm not really ending it off aggressively. I'm not going at the end. Because mm-hmm. what a location bugle does, you're basically going, hey, guys, I'm over here. What are you guys doing? And you want them down to you back. Hey, it's John. I'm over here. And you're going to have John. You're going to have Phil. You're going to have Darcy. You're going to have different elk all over the place, and they're going to all answer you. Now you know where they are, and they know where you are. So that's basically what the what a location bugle is for. Okay. So, and then moving on to, okay, let's say that they're getting more aggressive. Is that when you would normally put the bugle yeah. away and turn to cow calling then? No, I, 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 I love bugling. Okay. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bugling fool by heart. So if I can fool an elk with my bugle, that's, that's how I go. It's, so explain the process then of sure. like after you've located them, how are you drawing yep. them in? Okay. So a lot of my stuff is basically you'll do the uh, location bugle. And basically, if you get an answer, or even if you don't get an answer, if you're on the ridge out there, you can just listen on that ridge for a few minutes before you even spit out a location bugle. I'm listening for 10, 15 minutes once I get, this is first thing in the morning, once you get into your spot where you're going to listen over the ridge, I'll basically listen for 10, 15 minutes and see if an elk will actually bugle on its own and give away his location before you even have to do anything. That's kind of one of the keys to moving in on elk is let's find out where they are without telling them where you are. So a lot of those bulls, they've moved up the ridges and up into the hills from their, from their feeding areas. First thing in the morning, they'll get up on a, a little plateau, a little bench kind of thing. And those bulls at this time of year, they're going to have some cows, but one cow, two cows, that's not enough for one bull. They want five, six, seven, eight. They want 20 cows if they can get them. So what a bull does, if he's not doing location bugles, he'll do what's called like an advertising bugle. Just like a location bugle, but you're you're throwing in your growl at the end and you're getting a lot more aggressive, trying to sound awesome for a cow elk. And you're basically saying, hey, ladies, I'm over here. Come check me out. So that'll go like this. <laughs> you're throwing that growl in to the end totally different from a location bugle and one thing i will say is you can hear a lot of hunters when they're moving in on the elk because they don't understand what they're saying to the elk they'll move in on the elk and 200 yards back they gave them a location bugle well they move two 300 yards up these guys will give another location bugle so it's almost like they're saying hi to the elk again and it 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 kind of almost puts the elk on edge because in real elk language, they know that elk is back there. They already said hi to him. Now he's closed a different distance to like halfway. There's no need to say hi again kind of thing. That Mm -hmm. makes sense. Yep. So yeah. So you got location bugle, advertising bugle, and you got like more, more advanced stuff, which I don't know if we want to get into that tonight or whatever. You got like lip ball, lip ball bugles. It's what more about aggressive. Chuckles? Yeah, chuckles are a great thing. Um, you pretty much need a. You can do it without a without a tube, but ch- chuckles are kind of nice because you're talking to the cows and you're also talking to bulls, which is a really nice thing. So basically, you're you're kind of you're breathing out with the reed. You're making that yeah sound out, and then with your voice, you're going. <clears throat> So, yeah, yeah. so, and then if you do it with a tube, it's a lot more realistic with a, with a bugle tube, obviously. So what advantages are there to chuckling? Like what is chuckling for elk? Basically, it's an invitation. So when you're chuckling to an elk, you're telling him it's okay, things are okay over here. And it could be a bull talking to another bull, could be a bull talking to a cow. Basically, it's just saying, come on over. Because in the elk language, you have to go to them. That's what's Mm -hmm. normal in the elk world. We always, we're trying to do it the opposite way. We're trying to call them to us, right? Mm -hmm. And it just, it doesn't, 
you have to kind of switch it around because if you get a bugle from a bull, he's telling you, no, dude, you come to me no matter what. So they're the king. They want you to come to them, bow to them no matter what. So, Okay. And uh, Muck or Dieter, did you guys have anything to add on what uh, Travis has been talking about so far? I have one thing that uh, when you get into uh, – I. I think what Travis said was spot on about the lo uh, location bugle. Like the, if you've ever watched a video and you've seen elks across the, at different points, they're basically doing that. There's no real urgency, but if you get in close and you have an elk that's bugling, um, they stop bugling. And I always refer to it as they start to scream at you and it's more of an anxiety or if, uh, if, they, if, if they do want to come for a fight, they basically, they don't bugle at all. So if you, if you located a bugle and, or a bull and he bugle at you, but then you got in tight and, and, uh, he knows you're there, they'll, they, they almost scream at you and, uh, uh, they don't really, they don't do the traditional bugle that you hear. They kind of just go like that at you. And you know that you got a really worked up bull when you get to that point. Yeah, I want to add a couple of things about the chuckles real quick, um, just to elaborate yep. a little bit more. Um, so the chuckles, I just want to share with with people how to do that. Just just one more time, really quick, or just go into a little bit more detail. So you put a diaphragm, and you're using a diaphragm type call into your mouth, okay? And it's like a cow call, okay? But when I hit that high note, what I'm going to start doing is just dropping off my tongue right away. Okay, then I'm going to take it a step further. Just like Travis said, what I want to do is, and do this slow at home when you practice it. It's really important to do it slow because you'll start to build up your coordination to it. Um, you'll start to build up your coordination to it. So it's going to be like a... I'm going to start going uh, at the end now. And then like Travis said, start, if you want to get, you don't have to do this, but if you want to get a more realistic, the most realistic that you can sound, start sucking air in, just like Travis said. So it's going to be, do it one at a time though. Do it slow. And then after a little while, you'll start to get that coordination. You're not going to get this the first night you do this. It might take a couple of days. It might take a week or two. <laughs> see what i'm doing i'm putting it all together to do it so yeah and be before we end this tonight i want to i want to talk about read care diaphragm care as well so um when you're ready for that mike i'll talk about that but okay. i just wanted to elaborate just a little bit more on the on the chuckles and and by the way i just want to say one more thing about the chuckles sometimes bulls never bugle Sometimes that's all they do is chuckle. And if that's all they do is chuckle, you chuckle too. But understand something, what's going on in nature. When they're chuckling, <laughs> they're actually peeing on themselves. They're urinating. They're peeing on their necks. They're peeing on their underbelly. When you get a bull elk on the ground or in the rut, I mean, they stink. And that's part of the process when you're calling elk. They try to circle downwind. They try to smell that other bull because a big 400-inch bull that I've gutted out smells a lot different than a little spike or a little raghorn type bull, a little dinky bull. And if I can smell the difference, you know, they can smell the difference. So they might not want to, um, you know, get near a bull that might smell all rank like that. So it's just something to kind of keep in mind, especially when you're setting up for elk. When we talk about hunting techniques, if we get into that here, um, I'll talk about how to set up kind of downwind from them to try to intercept them as they're coming in as a caller. Um, didn't want to jump around there too much, but I want you to understand what the elk are doing when they chuckle and how to maybe just to practice that just a little bit more when you're, when you're going home and doing it yourself. That's it. Awesome. Yeah. yeah thanks guys. Um, Travis, uh, did you have anything more you wanted to add in yeah. maybe some tips and tricks there? Yeah, for sure. Um, basically when I learned first started calling elk, um, everybody wants to call in the big six by sixes and, have all the glory, right? But if you call in a spiker and you have the opportunity to, to play with that little guy 
I mean, I remember back to when I was like 14 or 15 years old, I was sitting on the edge of a field and really didn't know what I was doing a whole lot back then. You're just throwing a reed in, you're making some elk sounds. Well, this little spike came out and man, I got to tell you, I played with that little guy for two and a half hours, like straight. He would go out in the field further away out, wide, wide open field. And he would work his way back into like, I'd say like 25, 30 yards, like broadside, just walking back and forth, walking back. And he was talking to me the whole time. And then he would go back in the bush and then I would kind of let him go for 10, 15 minutes and not say anything. And then I would start up like cow calling and doing a little bit of chuckling because I was trying to learn to do that. I don't even know if I was doing it right, to be honest with you. But this little guy, just he kept coming in the bush and then coming back out in the field. So anytime you get a chance to actually play with any elk, be it a cow, a cow, spiker, a six by six, don't be scared. And if you're another thing, if you're out there with your buddies, don't be scared to call in front of them. Like they're, yeah, you're going to have some laughs and all that kind of stuff, but you're going to progress as a caller so much better. And your buddies are going to be better for it too, as well. Right. So, and I just see that, like you get some guys, they're very proficient at calling and, They'll take a couple hunting buddies out and your buddy will be like, okay, well, throw out a bugle or something. And they were like, no, 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 you do it. You do it. If you're that buddy that's a little bit shy, if someone says, you know, throw out a bugle or do whatever, let it rip, man. Just have fun with it. And there's no, there's no right or wrong way to bugle. It's whatever you feel you want to do with it. Just let it rip. If it comes out as a squeaky little mess, whatever, just Try another bugle right after and try to improve on it. I've personally seen where I've actually went to a spot with a newbie hunter buddy. I let out a nice, perfect little, you know, two, three note bugle, location bugle. And we sat there for 10, 15 minutes and nothing. We didn't hear nothing. Well, my buddy's like, I did that a couple more times, two or three times. And then uh, my buddy's like, oh, there's no elk here. So do you mind if I give it a whirl? And he was, I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll give her. I had him my bugle tube and uh, he had his own little reed and he let out this squeaky little shrill, nasty sounding little bugle. It wasn't perfection by any means, but you know what? 30 seconds later, we heard a, and it was a nice big herd bull across the river that I knew was there and I knew he had cows and he answered that little squeaky little bugle. So I'm honestly telling you guys, don't be scared to bugle out there, especially in front of your friends. Get out there, cow call, calf call, bugle. Try doing some chuckles. Um, one of the hardest calls to learn is the lip ball, and that's where you sputter your lips. And I, I took my wife out and, I, and a good friend, and I was just, this is probably 10 years ago, I was just starting to learn how to lip ball. So lip balls, you're kind of, you're kind of sputtering your lips. It's easier to do with a with a tube for some reason for me. <laughs> so you're just kind of sputtering your lips, like I guess people say when you're doing a, a tuber or whatever. Well, when I first learned how to do that, I sounded uh, you sound you're spitting everywhere, and your lips are <laughs> your lips are flappy, and there's spit going everywhere. And I'm trying to do this out in the bush, and uh, Literally, my wife and my buddy were rolling in the grass laughing. And they're like, oh, my goodness, you sound pathetic. It wasn't. <laughs> it was even worse than that. Like, I'm trying to do it bad. So, like, you can kind of hear what I'm talking about. But, honest to goodness, like, two minutes later, there was a bull. He just screamed at us. And he was he was closing the distance fast. And within about. I would say, I don't know, two, three minutes. He covered probably 150 yards through the bush and he circled around. We were standing on a cut line in, in thick, thick timber so we could see down either way because uh, they don't come out on the cut line and just walk down the line straight to you. They always come through the thick bush. Well, it wasn't honestly a minute and a half, two minutes later, he covered 150 yards and he's directly downwind of us now with his head and his neck, his whole chest area, his antlers. Turned out he was a beautiful six by six. He screamed the whole way in. And 
I, the look on my wife's face and my buddy and even my face was like, holy cow, we just did that, right? So, so I nope. guess the the question is then like when would you let ball like what where what instance or situation? Well, yeah, you see a lot. Um, it's a pretty aggressive call. Uh, basically, a lip ball is basically a, a bull that's keeping his cows rounded up, and he's he's talking to the ladies. Basically, is what he's doing. So if you do that out in the bush, and I don't run around just lip balling all the time all day long. But if you do that in the bush and another bull hears that, he automatically knows, hey, he's got ladies. What does Mm -hmm. a bull want? September? They want ladies, right? So you throw out a nice little lip ball. (laughs) And that's just being silly and goofing around just so everybody can hear what you're going to sound like. That, that, those bulls take notice of that. For sure. So I've got a I've got a relevant question here from Stu. Uh, he says it's been my experience. The higher the pitch on the locate bugle, the more responses I get. What are your thoughts? Exactly. And I and agree with weigh in on that. Yeah. 100%. Sorry. I say because it travels. Yeah. Yeah. What's your thoughts there, Dieter? The it carries through the air a lot more. And that higher pitch, it just seems to, you know, what we're doing when we're, when we're calling animals, I don't care if it's coyotes or, or geese or whatever we're calling. It's like what we're doing is we're casting out sound and we're trying to, we're throwing out these pitches, to trying to strike a neuron in their brain, trying to get them to react. And we're trying to like fishing, trying to reel them into us. Right. Um, and he's right. Those higher pitches and it, and, Really, it goes back to a lot of these, you know, open rea type cow calls like this. It gives out that high, loud pitch, <laughs> you know, that just seems to get them cranked up. I don't for some reason, but uh, but he's right. He he's going to get a lot more response with those higher pitches. But the lower pitches don't underestimate this, especially in a cow call. That's a mature cow. Cows also follow other cows that have been there, done that. Those lead type sounds that. Okay. And I don't care what call you use. I got several rum. That was a Carlton. This is a Rocky Mountain game call. <laughs> yeah, that low, sweet spot for that. And a bull wants to breed a cow, not a calf. That is a cow call. So kind of keep that in mind. Okay. Well, that was a great question there, Stu. Thanks for that. Well, one thing I would say to Stu there as well, like, yeah, he's, he's got a lot more responses from the high note. Be careful if you're hunting in a high pressured, high hunter area, because you're throwing out those high notes and hunters for two miles down the canyon are going to hear you as well. So, I mean, I personally like to use a lot of the lower, start off with some cow stuff, maybe do a light little chuckle, maybe something like that. Fish the water that's close out in front of you before you start casting, casting, casting. You know what I mean? Because those elk can literally be 100 yards right in front of you, and you don't even know it. Right. But, yeah, great question, Stu. Um, uh, Travis, uh, do you have anything else particular that you wanted to go through on Bugle? So we've covered the locate. We've covered the attraction. Yeah. Um, we've covered the chuckle and the lip ball. Is yeah. there anything else that uh, that is, seems relevant uh, to our audience? Yeah. Uh, there's – there's sounds I use out in the bush when you're actually out hunting. The fancy bugles we use on the world stage, lip balls and the fancy high notes and all that fancy stuff. Out in the real world in the bush, if you're a bugler and you like the bugle, you got to learn the fancy little stuff that really draws in elk. And I'm not talking about advertising bugles. I'm talking about like moans and groans and little stuff like that, like moaning and groaning, pulling grass, portraying the issue like you're actually a real elk out there. Cool. Can you hear that? Mm-hmm. You have a they did a lot of, of combination stuff there. 
Yeah, exactly. And it's yearning type stuff. You start doing that yearning type stuff when you're out in the in the bush. Those bulls, they they yearn to come to you. That's what they're that's what they're coming to. And basically, it's you're a bull basically that has a little a cow that could be hot. She's in estrus, and you're trying to get her to stand. Well, you do that out in the bush, you're going to call in bull after bull after bull. This is kind of like my inside secret trade secrets here. So, but I want you guys to know, like, it's not all out flashy bugles and telling every animal out there where you are. It's right. get down and dirty, pull grass, you know, scuff your feet on the ground, knock some sticks on trees, like make elk type sounds and throw in that yearning type stuff. Even with your cow stuff, it's the same with the cow stuff. Like you can do a more, a boring mew all day long. After a while, that gets to be boring. Even as a caller, you start going. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. You do that stuff out in the bush and it's like, it's tenfold. Like you're going to call in way more elk. Well, and I think that brings up a good point is like, elk in the especially in the rut they're not quiet right yeah so i know Dieter had touched on that you know sound like a herd of elk yeah well you know that also kind of goes outside the parameters of just calling right specifically so i i think that's a really good point did uh, either of you uh mock or Dieter, want to touch on any of that here We've got a couple uh, when, I'm, when i'm doing the calling typically for somebody um i like to get a crosswind in front of me um because that elk's going to circle downwind to me 90% of the time, maybe 95% of the time. He's going to yeah. try to smell me, um, thinks I'm another elk. And he, even if you're not making bull sounds and you're just cow calling, they're still going to circle downwind of you. So let's say we're, we're hunting together and you're out in front of me here and where there's a wind going this way like this. I'm going to put you out at about a 45 degree angle to me here if the bull's straight out in front of me. And this bull, when he comes in, he's going to, and I say go out probably 50, 60 yards. And when this bull tries to circle me to smell me, this, the call or the, the hunter is going to intercept that bull and hopefully get a shot. That's, that's the whole name of the game. Work the wind in your favor. Don't, you know, you want the wind to be in your face as much as possible, but he's going to try to circle you. I've right. had elk come circle me 180 degrees around me. I've heard him beagle all the way around, but I was hunting with some experienced, some inexperienced hunters that didn't move. They didn't know to move. And I guess I didn't explain that to them. I thought yeah. it had better sense than to just stay where they were and have that bull circle us. And he, they should have run off and tried to intercept that bull is what they should have done. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's yeah. answering the question or not, but that's, that's typically how, how an elk comes in on you and how you want to set up for them when, when they are coming in. But going back to those sounds, as a caller and I'm further away back here, I can get away with stomping my feet, boom, 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 just taking a tip of your boot and just tamping it in the ground like your elk moving around. I've literally just picked up like little stones and just toss it over here like a elk kicked a rock or they're like Travis said, break a stick or even take another stick and just imitate a bull raking, raking a tree mm -hmm. um, a lot of times. And that bull will s circle downwind of you. Great. Uh, anything to add there, Mark? But just uh, a, a couple of things that uh, elaborate off of what Travis was saying. And um, when it gets to calling for bulls, people have to understand there's really two things. There's calling for people and then there's calling for wild animals. And uh, Travis talked about calling at the world stage. And these guys are these guys are champions. They know how to do that. Um, but when you're learning to call, uh, I have a saying that uh, I say in my seminars is it's, it's uh, fear missing out over fear, fear of failure, meaning you should fear not going or not being in the bush and calling over how you sound. Because we, when I get next to these guys and we start blowing, we can sound like a really good elk. But at the end of the day, a wild elk doesn't care. 
he there's so many different vocal sounds that they make that if you're a good caller or a bad caller it doesn't matter the fact that you're just out there doing it is so important i think people hold themselves back when it comes to bull calls because they hear people that are really good and they don't they, they forget that the, the elk don't know sure if we're in the bush, we might be able to say, oh, that's another hunter by the way we heard them bugle, but it doesn't matter to a wild elk. So I always tell people, you know, fear missing, missing out over fear, fear of failure because uh, it, you're, who cares what you sound like? And then, and then the only other thing uh, uh, I was going to talk about when it comes to bull calls is for me, I use bull calls as a locator only. Uh, I'm maybe different than the other guys on the panel that, that I really put a lot of stake in the cow call and cow talk. And so uh, I use a bull call as once I locate it, I sort of put it away. I don't, I, I don't like to challenge them. I don't want them to come screaming and kicking in. Uh, I call that TV elk. But uh, so you, we, we've got different, uh, like Travis likes to bowl call, but I don't like to bowl call. I, mm -hmm. I, once I locate them, I put it away and then I try to seduce them with the cow talk. So that's all okay. I was going to say. Perfect. No, that's, yep. that's great. It's good to, it's good to talk about different styles, right? Um, yep. Shane has a question here. I typically hunt down here, uh, where elk stay quiet. Why do some, why do some elk stay quiet? And then on top of that, he is, does it also hurt to just keep bugling? Well, it, I would it, say it depends on the time of year. A lot of times too. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, if you don't mind me jumping in here, Travis, if you're hunting in an area yep. that's high pressure, the elk don't talk a lot. Um, Roosevelt elk. If you hunt on, hunting on the coast, like in BC or Oregon or Washington, it's only rainforested in, in the Western North America. And those elk tend to be a little bit more quiet. Um, the Roosevelt elk though, I've noticed when it is hotter than heck outside, they're the most vocal, like a Rocky mountain elk. But the second it rains, you would think they'd get cooled off. They, they, tend, to, they tend to get quiet. But if you're hunting in areas that are heavily pressured, the elk don't talk a lot. And I've noticed something else over the last 20 years, uh, when there's a lot of wolves in the area, elk don't talk as much. They've learned how to evolve that way because they've learned that calling a lot attracts other predators that eat them. So they do not call as much. So a lot of times to, to answer your question, you got to be right on top of a bull before he even opens up. And when they do open up, this is all you hear a lot of times. just a little, just a, a little moan like that. And um, if that's the case, listen, Elk have to evolve. They've got to breed in order to carry on the elk species. That's what it's about. So if they're not calling a lot, a lot of times they are going to come in silent on you, but they're going to come in. But cow calling might be a little bit more effective if they're not bugling. Cow calling might be more effective. Anybody want to add anything? Go ahead. That's I just want to, I just got one thing to add about the, the, the elk here in Saskatchewan. Uh, we have high pressure. And so we find, I find that the elk do a lot of their talking before and after, uh, like when it's dark. So before sunrise and then after sunset. Uh, and of course, as hunters, we're not out in the bush, we're missing a lot of that. So we, they, it's like they flip the switch as soon as the sun starts to come up, they, 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 they'll go silent on you. And that's because they're an educated elk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, now there was a comment that happened quite early on here, but we hadn't really got the stream going yet, but this is a good time to, to talk about this. So boreal pursuit, uh, they said, I had an encounter this past fall, had a bull going and I started to throw in some cow calls. Next bugle I heard was 200 yards away and I couldn't catch up. What do you think happened? I can tell you. So these cows, these cows are just as much competition for those bulls or the bulls are for the cows. So a lot of times, a lot of times when you, so these cows have their own little group. They have their own little group right here, right? And they have their man, they have their bull. The second you let out a cow call of any kind, I don't care what brand it is. All of a sudden, what happens? They're moving away from you. 
those cows don't want to lose that bull and they don't want to be around other cows. They, because when they come into estrus, they want to be bred. So what I do with that situation is this. If they're moving away from me, even a bugle, a lot of times on public land, I bugle, they bugle, I bugle again, boom, they're moving away. And there's no way a human can keep up with an elk. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, especially on public land, what I do is I give the illusion, okay, he's moving away. I already know that, right? Just like this, this um, person's having that experience. What you want to do is give that bull or those cows the illusion you want to move away the opposite direction also. Try or just bugle softer or cow call softer. Give them the illusion you're nervous, I'm nervous. Make it sound like you're moving away. Call softer. Or if I'm the if I'm the caller and you're the hunter, I'm moving away a hundred, hundred and fifty yards. Let that elk, let those elk, that herd of elk think that I'm moving away. That tends to relax them. So it allows my hunter, if you're if you got a hunter with you, to sneak in to try to cougar in as close as you can to where he last heard or she heard that last elk sound and try to get in tight and then just let a little cow call it just to see what you can do. I mean, you have nothing to lose, right? So that's how I hunt them. Move away, let them think that you're relaxed and have somebody cougar in. If you're by yourself, still move away. Let them slow them down. You're not pressuring them anymore. You're moving away too. But then try to cougar in as tight as you can to where you last heard them and see if you can get it going again. Great. Does anybody else have uh, anything to add to that? They could have winded them. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point too. Yeah, you know what? That's a that's right on the wind thing. Uh, this is probably one of the best piece of kit that you could have as a wind indicator. Uh, everybody needs to get one of those. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. So I I actually have a question myself, and I think this would probably be relevant to a lot of the viewers that'll watch this as well. Is Let's say you have an obstacle like a river between you and that herd of elk. Uh, I know for me personally, where where my spot is, we've got this uh, obstacle. It's a river. Uh, the other side is not public land. And um, you have to get them basically across that body of water to be able to, you know, have an attempt at, at them. So is there any sort of uh, strategy in terms of the calling to basically finish them. So if you can kind of get them to that edge, how do you get them to commit to come across an obstacle? That's really, really, that's a really difficult task. Uh, especially if they're, if, if he's satisfied with being over there, like he has cows and he feels safe, it's really hard to pull a bull across a water source or, or anything like, or even a fence for that matter, because they don't want to go through the effort of doing that. They're, they're subjecting themselves to being vulnerable when they do that. And so they, it, they, it's really hard to do that. The, my experience of, I have pulled bulls across uh, rivers in BC before, uh, but it's strictly, I've caught a really uh, rut crazed bull that was looking for cows and I brought, I brought them across, but that's my experience. Like that's a really difficult task. Like they'll sit over there and call to you, but they won't come across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They're very tough. That's uh, you have an opening, you have a river, you have anything, even a cut line. Like in BC and Alberta, we have cut lines everywhere through the bush. I've had them where they won't even cross the cut line. I mean, you're in the middle of a bush two or three miles deep and they won't cross an open cut line. So you pretty much, that's their mentality. Again, you have to get across that opening as fast as you can. In your case, you can't get across that river because it's not public land over there. Uh, you're almost, you're almost stuck hunting the elk that are actually on your side already, but mm -hmm. you know, and there are going to be elk over there. If there's elk on the other side of the river, there's going to be elk on your side. It's just, they could be two, 300 yards down. They could be three miles down. It's just a matter of if that land permits you to move along there, um, calling is going to help because they're going to come to you to a, to a point. But like uh, Dieter said before, you have to get so close to some elk. Like you got to break their little bubble before they'll even make a peep. And I'm talking like where we had in Alberta here, sometimes it's within – 80 100 yards like you can 
call and call and rake and do whatever you want outside of that little hundred yard bubble and you don't hear nothing. Mm -hmm. But the minute you keep going down the, the game trail and basically you get 70, 80, 90 yards into that little zone, if there's enough there, he's going to make a peep of some sort. Mm -hmm. so. okay. And I just want to elaborate. Every elk is different. Um, I've had elk probably about three years ago here, just south of me, probably about a half hour from here. I had an elk run. We have these clear cuts, these big, huge clear cuts that they do all the logging up here in northern Idaho. And I had an elk run 600 yards across a wide open clear cut during rifle season to come to the elk, the cows that he was hearing. And um, that's something I want to elaborate on, too. If you do hunt the states or anything like that, and it's during the rifle season, you know, even if, though the elk could still be bugling, as soon as those rifle start, shots start going up, elk, sh the bulls shut up. They tend to shut up a lot because they're nervous. But I have a lot of luck calling elk to me using cow calls because there's safety in numbers. The more, again, the more elk you can sound like, they're coming to you for a different reason during a rifle season. They're coming to you because they're nervous and they want to be around other elk. Where the rut, they're coming to you because they want to breed other cows. They want to breed a cow right. or cows. So kind of understand the psychology of elk when you're when you're hunting them a little bit, why they might be coming into you different times of the year. I hope that helps. No, that's an excellent point. Um, anybody, uh, either of you two have anything to add there, Travis or Muck? Not really. For my end, it's pretty good there. Okay, and yeah, Shane had replied he's uh, in northeast Saskatchewan, so he was guessing that it was probably pressure maybe that they were kind of not uh, not talking too much there. Um, I haven't had any more questions come in. Is there anything else that outside of what we've talked so far that any of you uh, want to elaborate or really bring home for the for the viewers today um, in terms of of the elk calling or a little bit on the elk calling and strategy here before we start wrapping things up? I have one thing. Um, when, when Dieter and Travis and myself, I guarantee you, and we learned, we had to learn the old school way, which is get feet in the, in the bush and listen to the elk and be there this day and age, the best uh, tool you have is the internet to learn to do elk talk because all you have to do is a simple search of, of cow talk or bull talk, and you can get those different tones and you can practice by that. Where when we, when we learned, we had to listen to the elk in the wild because we didn't really have, I mean, there might've been videos that we could watch, but there certainly wasn't the, you know, Google elk calling and you can get hundreds of different sounds. So use that tool to your advantage, put a reed in your mouth and put uh, you know, Google the sounds and then try to emulate what they're in. One of the, one of the things I always say to people is when you're practicing, please practice with a tube because it'll give you the octave that you want to trust and hear. When we call, when we're calling without a read, like if I put a read in my mouth right now, we know that when we put the tube on there, it's going to sound really good, but somebody that's not, so we're uh, confident in that they're going to think that doesn't sound right because it doesn't without a, without a tube on it. So if you have a tube, please practice with it because then you will get that in you. You'll imprint that in your mind, the sounds that you need. So if I'm sitting here at my computer, I Google on YouTube elk calling, I want to have my tube so that I can emulate that. And then the last tip I have when it comes to hunting elk or for when I'm trying to get a bull with a bugle is I always to do what he's doing. If he's growling, I'm growling. If he's, if he's chuckling, I'm chuckling. If he's just locating, I'm locating. All I want, I don't want to over, uh, over be over aggressive to him. I don't want to make him submissive to me. I want him to, to sort of feel well comfortable, but I just want to do exactly what he does. I've had the most success. If he be, if he chuckles at the end of his thing, I chuckle at the end of mine. So just, just sort of do what he does. Right. And I mean, for me, you know, uh, you know, I butchered a, a few elk in my day. Um, I always wondered what make, make them tick in a sense. And if you've ever looked at an elk throat and how big and wide open that thing is, and you actually look at their larynx, like their voice box, um, you know, you can understand why a tube is advantageous because 
the size of their lungs and the size of their throat and the power that they can produce their calls through. I mean, trying, I mean, as they come in, sure, maybe put the tube away if you're trying to be quieter or, or sound different, but uh, the tube uh, definitely, I, in my opinion, uh, it gives, it gives a lot of mimic to what they already have as their anatomy. Well, these, uh, these guys, these guys are champions at calling in the, uh, at the Rocky mountain elk foundation. They know the value of what a big tube sounded like when you're in competition, but, uh, Elk calling has evolved so much or the equipment has evolved so much in the years that it, so this is the call that I started my career with in 1990. It's a Larry D Jones and it actually has a screw in. It used to have a screw in um, piece that you just bit down on and blew at it, but I pulled it out and I used the tube. So if I was to blow into this, it would sound significantly different than this. If I did the same if I did the same call. So I would say that elk equipment or uh, equipment have evolved way better because when I went to the worlds in 2003, I only had this and Dieter probably a chuckle at me for taking this little call into the worlds because uh, I, I think I sounded okay, but I was going against guys that had the big tubes and it just, it, it wasn't even close the difference of the sound. So uh, I mean, that's how much equipment has changed. So I, I do ha carry this more nostalgia, but I always have a big tube now whenever I call it. It's not just because I want to overpower them. I just think the sounds are more realistic. Awesome. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Um, so Travis, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's in the little package that we'll be doing our giveaway with? Okay. So you guys just saw the tube there that Muck has there. We're gonna do a beagle tube. I'll throw in a couple three, couple three reeds there. Um, some of the popular ones. I'll throw in the new stuff I got. Probably lone bull, the full draw. There. So the lone bull is really awesome for like good stuff for bugling, and then the full draw is kind of a mix of cow, calf, bugling. It's a good beginner read right up to the really good caller. And then also I'll throw in like a cow read, like the Huntress. The cow reads are a thinner latex uh, than the bugling reads. So for anybody that's new, to kind of start on the little thin latex reads, whatever ones you buy, uh, look for the, the, the light latex reads. Those ones are gonna be the easiest ones to get sounds off right away. And cause that's gonna be the hardest part is getting that first sound. And mm -hmm. the worst thing you want to do is start off with a, with a triple read or a double or a really thick single latex and try doing some cow stuff because you're going to get frustrated. If you get frustrated, you're going to kind of give up. So right. we want you to power through. And so go with, a, a, I, that's why I'm saying like the, the Huntress is a really nice. Yep. The light latex, basically super easy to learn on just barely hiss across it um and you'll you'll just you'll get sounds right away it's just they're super easy just do that hissing sound that we showed you just and you'll just get you know you'll just get a sound of some sort and that's your tongue is just barely your tongue is just barely just holding the reed up in the roof of your mouth that's mm -hmm. all it's doing and then throw in that hissing sound and you'll get sound right away and and that's Perfect. why I was saying early in, in the in the seminar here, I was talking about the little kids that would come by my booth at the trade shows. You give those little kids five, 10 minutes and they're just across that reed and bam, they got it. They, and now when you start making sounds on these reeds and through a bugle tube, you call in the first elk that you ever call in, you are hooked for life. Like you are bitten. Like September is going to be your favorite month for every year going forward and for like me and my wife, our wedding anniversary is not in September. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> so, but yeah, awesome. and uh, we'll throw in a call pouch. I don't have a pouch here at my desk here, but I have little orange call pouches that hold like eight or 10 reeds and I'll throw in uh, the thermals wind checker. Perfect. That's just really light power powder there. You just pop the top and put your finger over the hole because there's a hole in there. You can see the hole. 
don't shake it up and down because it's really there's like seven different powders in here the there's powders that are thicker or more coarse they grind up the, the powder so it's finer and finer and finer so shake it sideways and then literally just squeeze it. you can puff it lots if you want or you can just literally just a nice little mist yeah, coming can see that there you know what i mean so you can yeah. give it the more you shake it the more it comes out but honestly on a nice cool calm morning that tiny little smoke is all you need to know which way the wind's doing and another trick that i know Dieter will know this from larry uh from uh, wayne carlton on his stabilizer of his bow he used to tie a, a long piece of yarn just hanging off his stabilizer off his bow and he'd hold his bow out and that yarn would just sway to one side or the other great little indication what the wind's doing at all times so that's we'll throw that in as well that's the thermals so thermals call pouch three reeds and a bugle tube pretty good little combo there yeah, no, that's awesome. So if yeah. you guys are watching and you haven't commented yet, I need to know who's watching. So please comment if you haven't. Just say, hey, I'm here um, just so that I can uh, so I can put you guys down for the draw. Um, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Well, I'll uh, I'll tell my elk story while we're waiting to to hear for some more people. Uh, so this bull here, that's my first bull that I ever shot. Um when I, I only scored him 10 years after I shot him, and that's probably my fault. He probably shrank a bit, uh, but uh, he, he scored just over 310. And uh, he actually came in on the bugle, and he, he was growling up a storm really late morning. And we were actually just about to leave the valley, and we, we hustled down the hill. We met him. He came in to about 15 to 20 yards, and uh my my buddy he had first shot he was hunting with a recurve he didn't have a shot so the agreement was that i could take him with the rifle and uh managed to double lung him but he he was a lot bigger bodied than his rack was it was uh it was really cool um he, we actually found an old bullet in his neck so if you don't think these animals are tough then uh then you haven't hunted out quite a bit yet because yeah he had a healed up wound with a bullet in his neck uh when we caped him out and stuff just just craziness so uh Bo boreal pursuit had another comment here he had a bull do an advertising bugle uh so he took it up to a level and lip balled and then the bull went silent so the bull did an advertising bugle he did a level up and lip balled but then that bull he was calling with went silent what do you think happened there I can tell you he exactly. Too aggressive. He, they might have been too aggressive and made the, that lip ball is a pretty, pretty aggressive sound. Okay. And I think all these guys would agree with that. Um, yeah. I think he just spooked the other bull. It just sounded bigger than him. Yep. Yeah. If you have an advertising bull, basically, he's looking for cows. Give him what he wants, give him a cow sound. But in all honesty, if you have an advertising bull, he's down below you, probably down a ridge or two or something like that. I would just totally keep silent, start, get on a game trail and just sneak your way down into him, get as close as you dare. And then usually when a bull's advertising, he's usually going from a point A and a point B. He's on a ridge and he'll be going back and forth. He'll get to A, he'll bugle, do his advertising bugle. Stand there for a second, listening for cows, and then he'll move back to B, and he'll bugle over there. These bulls will do this for an hour or two hours in the morning, advertising, looking for more cows. So what you as a hunter can do, get in there. You know he's coming to point A. Sneak down as close as you can to that point A. Let him bugle and do his thing. Don't say anything. Let him sne go sneaking off to point B where he's going to bugle again. It's usually like 100 yards in between the two kind of thing he's bugle off two different directions kind of thing you're going to stay at point a when he gets to point b let him do his bugle over there and then simply look away away from him and do your two little what i like to do is a couple little cow calls so i look away from where the bull is yeah. 
just two simple mutes. That's all it's going to take. The first mute you do, his ears are going to per perk up, and he's going to be looking your direction. The second mute that you do, he's coming, and he's coming in on a string. So you better be, be ready. Have an arrow knocked. Make sure you got a shell in the chamber. Your scope dialed down so you can shoot. You know, you're going to be like probably 50, 60 yards at that point. If you're bow hunting, you're going to be even closer. I try to sneak in as close as I dare without them seeing you. That's why you want to let them walk away, then move into your point A. Um, give those two cow sounds. I guarantee you that bull is coming looking for you right now. So be ready. As soon as you see tips coming through, and tips of the antlers, go to full draw and be ready. And when he comes into your opening, just I like to give a little bark to stop them because a bark, they stop instantaneously if you give a cow call they may take one or two steps and their whole kill region behind their front shoulder there it could end up behind a poplar tree or mm -hmm. a spruce tree or a little willow tree or something like that a bark stops them instantly they're on full alert looking to see what the heck was that mm -hmm. so. okay awesome yeah well i think uh, i think we're gonna just gonna wrap it up here we really appreciate uh the panel uh, Travis, Muck, and Dieter for being on this evening. Um, I hope that our viewers learned a lot because I'm definitely going to have to rewatch this myself to get all the information uh, out of this seminar. So um, thanks, guys, for being on the panel. And we want to thank our viewers that tuned in uh, today as well. We're, we're hoping um, if we didn't get if you didn't get a chance to ask a question or you have one later on, please still fill in the comment feed. Uh, we'll keep monitoring it here for, for the next little while as well. And uh, we'll also do an announcement of the draw here coming up soon uh, as well. So uh, thanks guys uh, for being on tonight and uh, we'll uh, look, I'll look forward to the elk season coming up here. Thanks guys. Thanks. All thanks, right. Mike. Thanks guys. Yeah. Thanks everybody good, for watching. Good, good luck guys in the season. That's a lot. All right.